In an upscale neighborhood in Austin, Texas, a 43-year-old single woman is found strangled. To hear that Diane was no longer alive was a total shock. It's not a typical crime scene. It was eerily clean and eerily undisturbed. And the chilling details begin to pile up. She felt like he was trying to lure her up to her bedroom. She said he turned from a man into a monster. It was horrifying. We finally zeroed in on what the motive was. The climax was actually the murder. Investigators are determined to get to the murderer before he gets his hands on his next victim. We felt like we had a murderer on the loose, and we didn't know when he might kill again. Austin, Texas, where the sun shines nearly 300 days of the year. November 15th, 2001, wasn't one of those days. We begin with some late breaking news. We've seen over 15 inches of rain in just a few hours. Causing tornado warnings for Austin and surrounding areas. Relentless rains and high winds are pounding the streets of Austin. In the northwest suburb of Great Hills, working from the quiet comfort of her home office, is 43-year-old Diane Hollick, a successful IBM project manager who lives the life many single women dream of. She worked hard. She had a beautiful home uh, with a gorgeous pool. She would throw parties. Diane would be going to some of the fanciest restaurants and fanciest dances and balls. But then she put on her cowboy boots and off to one of the local country bars. She'd go from one extreme to the other and fit right in everywhere. Determined to weather the fast approaching storm, Diane continues to work at home as the bad weather hits. We hadn't had rains in maybe five to seven years like that. We had a minimum of 15 tornadoes come through Austin, which is extremely rare. The brutal storm the night before has passed. Leaving in its wake an eerie calm, Diane's friend and local real estate agent, Lackey Brown, does her usual early morning stroll past Diane's house. I walked by her house, and she didn't come out to go for a walk, so I went on. Diane's phone goes unanswered as her colleague at IBM tries to connect with her for their weekly Friday meeting. I called her home number, and I didn't get her uh, to pick up, so I called her cell phone, and then I called her office number, and I left her messages on all three numbers. I knew that she had a lot going on, so I didn't think anything of it. But by early afternoon, Capcar has called eight times from her Dallas office trying to reach Diane. The last thing that um, she told me the night before was, I got to go. My girlfriend says the storm's headed right this way. And then I thought, OK, well, maybe, maybe there was damage at her house. Increasingly worried Diane might have been injured, her colleague contacts police. After the whole day, her not returning any calls, that just wasn't like her. She was more responsible than that. When neighbor Lackey Brown sees the officers arrive at Diane's door that evening, she offers to let them in with her key. She's no more than one step in when she feels a chill run up her spine. The dogs had missed in the dining room, and I said, well, something's wrong. You know, she would never let that happen. Upstairs, they make a grisly discovery. In the bedroom, they find Diane's fully clothed, lifeless body. Austin homicide detectives Eric De Los Santos and Tracy Garish are dispatched to the scene. It was a very beautiful home uh, in a very affluent neighborhood of Northwest Austin. Compared to other crime scenes that I've been to, this is probably the cleanest one I've ever been to. Nothing seems out of place until the investigators reach the bedroom. You had to really physically walk into the room and around the bed to even notice that she was there. She was kind of at an odd angle as if somebody had tried to push her underneath the bed, but she obviously wouldn't fit, so they just left. 
for the investigator's murder isn't the first thing that comes to mind. I thought that the possibility that she committed suicide and a family friend trying to save the, the family from shame or embarrassment, perhaps cleaned up the scene and positioned her in a very respectful manner and, and left her that way. But a closer look at the body reveals a situation far more sinister. On Diane's arms, bruised indentations. They appeared to be left by a zip tie. It's also obvious that she had a very deep ligature mark around her neck. The investigators can come to just one conclusion. We have a murder here, and this person cleaned up the crime scene. Who could have killed Diane Hollick? She trusted everyone, but she trusted this one person a little bit too much. Successful IBM project manager Diane Hollick is found murdered in her high-end North Austin home. We did find uh, the zip tied type injuries. We realized that she probably had been bound. Though there is no evidence of sexual assault. Upon entry into the bedroom, there was makeup and mascara or blood and mascara little droplets right at the entrance of the doorway. It looked like almost that somebody's face had been in that carpet. They also notice a strange marking on her face. She had an abrasion on her cheek that was had that orange yellowish tinge that resembled a rug burn. We figured that was probably a post-mortem injury, possibly from her being dragged. But this pristine crime scene is offering no clues as to who might have done it. That's when something catches Tracy Garish's eye. We saw a towel that was draped over a love seat that was near the front door. And I thought that was very odd. I mean, there was nothing that was out of place except for this towel. It looks like it was a towel that somebody had dried themselves off of and just casually thrown over the, the back of the couch. Investigators bag the towel for analysis, but fear whatever evidence it might offer won't be enough to lead them to Diane's murderer. As far as anything that was obvious and pointed its finger and said, hey, here's your killer, there was nothing in that house. So whoever did this, they spent time in the house, they spent time with the body, they cleaned up the, the crime scene, and then they left. By Saturday morning, Assistant District Attorney Darla Davis joins the investigative team. She was one of those ADAs that you can call up at 2 or 3 in the morning. You can hear her shake the sleep off and then say, OK, what do we got and what do we need to do? Right away, she knew this case was different from the rest. When I first saw the crime scene, it was immaculate. It was pristine. Nothing was out of place. Nothing was disturbed. Did Diane Hollick willingly open the door to her attacker? When you start a homicide investigation, especially when a woman has been killed, you want to start with the men that are closest to her. A free spirit, Diane had no trouble meeting men. We had a great time when we would go out. It never failed. She would meet someone. And we used to laugh about, well, we'll all take her cat stuffs. But Diane had yet to meet the one who would sweep her off her feet, recalls friend and neighbor Donna Hebner. She really wanted to get married. That was the one thing she wanted. She was looking for her right man. She'd meet lots of men, but it wouldn't be the right man and it wouldn't be the right time until Dennis. Dennis treated Diane like a queen. Dennis would show up sometimes with flowers for Diane. He would take her to very nice restaurants and just woo her. And soon Dennis popped the question with a $20,000 platinum engagement ring. One day she came home and we had a girl's dinner, and she was so, so excited about the ring on her finger, she just screamed in the air, I'm engaged. Not all of Diane's friends are thrilled with the news. I didn't care too much for him. Diane's relationship with Dennis was on again, off again. Every relationship has problems, but she didn't let you see it unless you knew her really well. Could Diane's killer be the man she was set to marry? There was some information that received that Perhaps the relationship had gone bad, so that was one of the areas that we were going to concentrate on. Dennis had his ups, he had his downs. Diane had told me of several arguments that they had had on the phone. Diane was very independent. She wanted to make sure she kept her independence as a woman, and that can cause issues between a fiancé and a husband-to-be. Committed to making it work, Diane decides to sell her home so she can move to Houston to be with Dennis. She enlists the help of friend and real estate agent Lackey Brown, but the economy is faltering and the housing market soft. 
We had it on the market for, I guess, about 30 days. Several potential buyers come to tour the house. But we hadn't sold it yet. After multiple failed attempts by police and friends to reach Dennis, some begin to wonder whether he could have had a hand in Diane's murder. Detective Garish had asked me if I thought anyone that Diane knew would do this to her. And I said no. But then she started talking about um, Diane's fiance, Dennis. Might something have pushed him over the edge? You know, he liked to be with Diane by himself, but she was a free spirit. She still did a lot of things with a lot of other people. Including one of her coworkers. He spent more time with Diane than Dennis did. He would walk her dogs. He would feed her dogs if she was out of town. He would just do certain things around the house. He was just doing what he could to be around Diane. Could Diane's relationship with her coworker have caused Dennis to take drastic measures? Or had her coworker been rejected one too many times by the woman he worshiped? Then when the workmate suddenly shows up at the crime scene, the investigators are on alert. He seemed overly eager to help us, um, which I thought was odd. That behavior raises red flags in our mind. And it does raise suspicions that this person could possibly be involved. He tells police that when he didn't hear from Diane, he thought he'd come by to check on her, and that he'd been at work on Thursday, the day Diane was killed. It was one thing to have him telling us where he was and telling us that he had not been involved in her murder, but we wanted to get the cold, hard records that would convince us for sure. While Davis issues a subpoena for the co-worker's work records, Tracy Garish makes contact with Dennis Connolly. When he got to Austin, he wanted to go by Diane's house first, but we needed him to come down to the station. We told him we were going to need to get some DNA from him, get some latent fingerprints from him, and also some work documentation that would prove that he was not in Austin at the time. We suspected that she had been murdered. Two men in love with the same woman had one of them killed with his own hands in a crime of passion. The devil come knocking on her door, and she paid for it, tragically. It's been 36 hours since the brutal murder of IBM project manager Diane Hollick, and investigators are focusing in on two possible suspects. One was her fiance, Dennis Conley, and the other one, he was a man who was spending quite a bit of time with Diane, even though she was engaged to another man. Whoever killed Diane had left few clues behind and taken something important with them. She was missing a $20,000 engagement ring. When the body was discovered, that ring was not on her hand. Lucky Brown said she never took it off, and we couldn't find it anywhere. Still, police can't be certain robbery was the motive for Diane's murder. This could have been that the perpetrator took some jewelry from her to make it appear to be a robbery and throw us off the scent of the real motive. Detectives bring in Diane's lovesick co-worker for questioning. We thought he could be a suspect at this point. This man bought her roses and expensive gifts. He talked quite a bit about how much he cared for Diane. But Diane did not reciprocate the feelings that this man had. Did she push him over the edge by rejecting his advances one too many times? She did tell me at one point that he probably was too close and needed to be pushed further away. Her thought was that he was infatuated. And sometimes when you get to the point of infatuation, you do need to say, oh, let's stop right here. What's more, the coworker had a key to the victim's home. Despite all of that. I didn't get the sense from him, even though he was overly enthusiastic, that he harbored any anger for her. And towards the end of the interview, for me, I just didn't get that cop feeling that he was going to be the suspect. Her cop feeling turns out to be bang on. We were able to obtain his work records for that Thursday that she was killed, and that confirmed that he was actually at work during the pertinent times. With one suspect crossed off the list, detectives now turn to Diane's fiance. Might things between them have soured to such an extent Dennis killed his bride-to-be? Investigators question him at length. I specifically talked to Dennis about he and Diane's relationship, how they met, how things were going. He offered up that they were both excited about getting married. He was questioned about his whereabouts on the Thursday 
uh, that she was killed. He recounted to us that he had talked to her on the phone that morning, but he did stay in Houston. He was obviously very upset. Uh, couldn't believe that that had happened. But is he telling the truth? We eliminated him through credit card records, through work records. He was actually not in Austin. He was at work during the time the murder happened. Mr. Connolly had an airtight alibi for the time of Diane's death. He offered up that he couldn't really think of anybody that she was enemies with that would want to do this to her. So who murdered Diane Hollick? It's been 48 hours since her death, and investigators seem no closer to identifying her killer. We were all feeling a little apprehensive, a little worried. Fear grows in the Great Hills suburb of Northwest Austin. It actually scared us enough that we wouldn't open our door to anyone unless we could see their face and knew who they were. That's when an interview with one of Diane's closest colleagues offers up an important new lead. Diane had told her that a man had come over wanting to possibly buy her house. She told me that the guy was very clean cut looking and that's why she let him in. He seemed well dressed, mid thirties. He had short hair and she was not threatened by his look. He had sold a ranch and that he was looking for a place that he would pay cash for. She seemed uh, excited that he was really interested in it. Diane is overjoyed at the thought of finally selling her home, but her close friend is alarmed at the risk she'd taken. Diane, don't let strangers in your house. The man had indicated to Diane that he was gonna be coming back later with his wife, and he thought that his wife was really gonna love the house. Who is this mystery man? Had he returned to buy Diane's home or take her life? At this point, almost everybody is considered a suspect. So we wanted to talk to him because there was the real possibility that he had been the one that had killed Diane. Investigators now have a suspect. The question is, who is he and how do they find him? At that point, it ups the stakes quite a bit because we believe now that we're looking for a perfect stranger. Austin investigators are under the gun to identify the man who murdered 43-year-old Diane Hollick. If he's done one, he may do it again. And we did not want a second victim. Had the man who toured Diane's home the day of her murder been the one responsible for her death? If so, he may already be on the prowl for fresh prey. And so we decided that we were going to canvas every house in the Great Hills neighborhood that was for sale. The investigators are alarmed by what they find. I believe there are about seven women that have this same story that a man had come to their home the day that Diane was killed and wanted to look at it without a real estate agent. Once we determined that we have a common denominator here, we started getting these women in to come in and give us statements. And Darla Davis observes an eerie pattern. I sat there at the police station and watched them come in one by one, this parade of really beautiful ladies. And they were all about the same age, mid thirties to mid forties. Well, it was starting to get kind of creepy and kind of eerie that this man that had been approaching these women had obviously been targeting them. He was doing this during the day. So there's a lot of women that are stay-at-home moms. And so there wasn't any husbands around. There wasn't any boyfriends around. While most turned him away at the door, one woman felt comfortable enough with a man to let him in. She said he was a very ordinary, plain, sort of looking man. He was between 5'11 and 6 feet tall. His hair was brown, kind of slicked back. Somebody that looked like he came from money. Oblivious to the warning signs, the woman encourages him to tour the house on his own, then immediately regrets her offer. She said that he was very, very nervous. It was almost as if his nervousness took over his entire personality. There was a creepy feeling or a not so safe feeling that she had with this guy. He didn't turn on any lights, didn't open any doors, and she really felt like he wasn't seriously looking at the house. When he asked to see the bedrooms upstairs, her uneasiness grows. He walked up the stairs and he kept calling to her. Oh, can you come and show me this? Oh, can you come and show me that? She felt like he was trying to lure her up to her bedroom. She would just shout the answers to his questions up the stairs, and no matter what he did, um, he was not able to uh, get her to go upstairs with him. The stranger eventually leaves, 
but not before giving the woman an important piece of information, his name. The name he left her was Walter Miller. So once we have the name, the research on the name begins. While investigators pour through their data banks in search of Walter Miller, the homeowner works with a forensic sketch artist to create a likeness of their suspect. There was the real possibility that he had been the one that had killed Diane. It was kind of decided, well, let's put this out to the news media and see if we can find somebody that maybe knows this guy or, or got a little bit more information than what we've got right now. A task made more urgent by the fact that Diane Hollick's pristine home had offered up few forensic clues. We weren't getting any physical evidence that we felt like would be able to identify who had killed her. The crime scene was offering us nothing at this point. The sketch is scheduled to air on the 6 o'clock news that night. But as the day wears on, investigators can't shake the thought that there's more to this crime than meets the eye. We decided to focus on something different which was possibly the sexual gratification aspect of this crime. Ms. Hollick had been fully clothed. There was no evidence at autopsy that she had been sexually assaulted. But just from our experience, we all believed that there was some sexual component to this case. We know that strangulation is a very personal uh, thing that can cause a lot of sexual gratification for the attacker. But how to track this sexual predator? We're going to have to use every trick that we know to try to find out who did this. The investigators return to the house to see if their hunch about the murderer's motive pays off. If there is seminal fluid in the home, we would be able to collect that and use it to get a possible DNA match. Since the test must be done in total darkness, Darla and her team wait for nightfall, then begin sweeping Diane's home. We looked in every room of the house with the alternate light source trying to find some trace of seminal fluid. But uh, we searched, and we searched. Unfortunately, we weren't able to locate anything. It was not a good feeling. <laughs> it was uh, fairly distressing that we had combed the crime scene and not been able to yield anything. Davis hopes that what little evidence they do have will yield better results. We had called in an expert in crime scene analysis to personally analyze and look at our evidence. Including the abandoned bath towel. He went over that towel with a magnifying glass over every inch of it and found these two very tiny hair fragments. Has Davis found the key to the killer's identity? Much to her disappointment. These were not complete hairs. These did not contain a root. And that's very important because if you have a root on the end of a hair shaft, then you're able to take that root and run DNA on it. And then you would be able to get a full profile that would be able to tell you exactly who the hair came from. Without the root, the hair would offer up only a partial DNA profile. We knew that the mitochondrial DNA by itself was not going to be enough evidence to tell us who did the murder. So we knew it was not going to be all that helpful to us. As for the name the mystery man gave to one of the homeowners. There was two people. One of them was like 101 years old. And the other, Walter Miller, was I think 51, which would have been too old for our suspect. It has been a long and frustrating 72 hours since Diane Hollick's murder. And the investigative team has worked day and night on the case. I just kept telling myself, we have to keep putting one foot in front of the other, keep the investigation moving. Because if the investigation stops moving, then it's dead. Will the sketch of the suspect offer up any new leads? We broadcasted the composite and kind of the story or ruse that this guy was using when he went to these women's homes. And it was probably within 10 minutes that somebody called our tip line saying that they thought that he had come to their home. Might they have finally found their killer? This man was not looking for a home. He was looking for a victim. The police sketch has uncovered a potential lead in finding the man who strangled 43-year-old Diane Hollick in her upscale Austin, Texas home. We got a phone call from one of the detectives downtown who said, we had a witness call in. She has some incredible information. You need to get here right away. This man apparently had come to her home six months earlier and was very, very forceful in wanting to get into the house. 
When the witness refuses to let him in, he leaves. But several months later, the strange man returns. Her husband has just left. She's home alone with her daughter. And he, again, tries to convince her to let him inside the house. And again, she's telling him, no, you can't come in my house. If you want to look at my house to buy it, you can call the realtor. But the man persists. He starts getting very agitated. He's yelling at her. And she finally convinces him that he has to leave. But she is so disturbed by this entire encounter with this man that she gets a piece of paper and a pen and scribbles down his license plate number off of his minivan. And she kept that license plate number in a drawer in her house. When she sees the composite sketch on the news broadcast days later, she immediately calls police. This lady tells us that, yes, this guy that gave a similar story was at her house, and she had his license plate number. It was like, wow, let's, let's get rolling on this. Finally, a break. The fact that uh, this man returned to her home and was so aggressive about wanting to get in uh, told us that he was amping up uh, his hunt. We felt like, because he'd gone to numerous neighborhoods all over Austin, that he had an urge right now that um, he was wanting to satisfy. Everything that we learned about this man made us more and more suspicious that this was the man that had killed Diane, that that's who we were looking for. Investigators run the man's license plate number through their computer database. The name from the license plate comes back to Anthony Russo. We realized that the physical description of Tony Russo very much matches the physical description that we were getting from all these women from these homes. But Russo seems an unlikely suspect. The married father of two plays in a Christian band and is the music director at the New Life in Christ Church in a quiet community a 40-minute drive from Austin. Could this God-fearing man have a dark side? We ran his name through a computer history check, and it showed that he had been convicted and sent to prison out of Lake Jackson, Texas. Lake Jackson Police Department said that Tony Russo was actually a suspect in numerous incidents of women being attacked and choked. And they were very surprised that he was not still in jail. He got a 20-year sentence and that he was out in eight years. So they felt like he was a very high-risk offender and that he was definitely a danger to women. We had been working several days, uh, very little rest. But when we got this information, and we got a name, and we all of a sudden we realized that this is a man who has a history of choking women. It was like we got a second wind, and we decided that we had to go and find him right away. We got to the Russo's house with the search warrant. The house was a, a trailer. Um, it was on a small plot of land. It wasn't the fancy ranch he had told the ladies that he had owned. Investigators find Russo at home. When Mr. Russo opens the door, he doesn't seem all that surprised that the police are there. He invites us in, and we tell him that his name has come up in an investigation in Austin and ask him if he'd be willing to come back to our office and speak with us about that. He seems rather calm, and he agrees uh, to go with the police. Can I ask what this is about? What we're going to do is we're going to basically ask you about your whereabouts on certain dates. With Russo out of the way, the investigators comb through his home. The search of the, of the trailer consisted of looking for the jewelry that belonged to the victim, the zip ties that could have been used in any possible ligature, anything that would give us some indication that he had been at the victim's residence. Meanwhile, Tony Russo is being questioned about his whereabouts on the day of Diane's death. On that particular day, he actually does put himself in Austin going to a religious uh, radio station that we have here in town. And that's near where Diane was killed, near Diane's home. He claims that he went down there to kind of get his band promoted, but that when he gets to the radio station, he knocks on the door. Sometimes they answer the door, sometimes they don't. When no one came to the door, I went ahead and left. Uh, About what time was that? Mm, four o'clock, I believe. At that point, that was pretty much when the storm was blowing in. He's asked point blank if he'd been searching for real estate. Uh, but he denied going to anybody's home, looking for a home, or even in the market to buy a home. And when shown a picture of Diane Hollick, Russo barely reacts. I don't recall ever seeing her. If she's saying that I've stole something from her, then I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know what to say. 
and I haven't stolen anything from anybody. I work my tail off for what I have. Back at Tony Russo's home. Once the search was completed, we found nothing. We just assumed that he probably threw everything away or hid it somewhere that we would never find it. With no confession and no evidence against Russo, police have no choice but to let him go. I'm disappointed, but it doesn't really surprise me. I think that somebody who's been in jail for eight years has had eight years to figure out how to commit a crime and not get caught by the police. And I think he was hunting and evolving and figuring out the best way he could, he could do something and get away with it. Investigators fear they've let a killer walk free. It was scary. It was very scary. We felt like we had a murderer on the loose, and we didn't know when he might kill again. Investigators have no hard evidence to link their only suspect, 37-year-old Tony Russo, to the murder of IBM project manager Diane Hollick. We really had nothing other than the general description. We knew we were going to need more than that. Russo admits to being in Diane Hollick's neighborhood the day of her murder, but says he was there to drop off a CD at a local Christian radio station. He had gone there and knocked on the door, and that the doors were locked, and that nobody came. Then he drove home. To verify Russo's alibi, investigators decide to pay the station manager a visit. We got a completely different story from the radio station manager. The manager basically told us that he knew Tony Russo, but he said that he never saw him that day. And given the approaching tornado, a visitor would have been hard to miss. Everybody in the station had to move to the front of the building, and they opened the door to equalize the pressure in case the storm came in. From that room, they had a direct view of the open front doors. So if anyone had approached the front doors the day of that storm, they would have seen them immediately. About what time was that? Mm, 4 o'clock, I believe. And they said if he'd have been there at 4, everybody would have been in the lobby. So we knew at that point that Mr. Russo was telling us an abject lie. But without proof he's their killer, Tony Russo will walk free. Then investigators hear from yet another female homeowner. This young mother was home alone. Her husband is at work. And a man comes and knocks on her door. He is holding a flyer in his hand that he had gotten from a box that was out in her yard. And he asks if he can come in her home. He was very cordial like he was with everybody else. Asked about the dogs, asked about the security system. She had two kids with her at the house, and one of them was sleeping in a bedroom. They walk around the house. And when they get into one of the bedrooms, he kind of spins around on her. She said he turned from a man into a monster. His eyes changed. His face changed. He looked not like a human being, but more like an attack animal. And she started to panic at that time. And then all of a sudden, she hears her baby cry. The woman runs from the room to attend to her child. Flustered, the man flees, leaving a critical clue behind. She noticed that he had brought one of the black and white flyers into her house. The woman slides it underneath a pile of colored flyers and puts the disturbing incident out of her mind. But when she gets wind of the search for a murder suspect posing as a home buyer, She called and she basically said, I think I might have a flyer with his fingerprints on it. We immediately sent a crime scene person over to the house to uh, pick up the flyer and bring it back to the station. Mr. Russo had told us in the interview that he was not looking to purchase a home, had not been looking at houses. Well, it has to be coincidental because I hadn't been in any neighborhood. He denied that he had ever taken a flyer from anybody's homes. I'm just telling you, I haven't done that. I haven't touched any flyers that I have ever been in Austin looking at houses. He said we would never find his fingerprint on any flyer ever. The lab results tell another story. We got a hit. Uh, we had four good latent fingerprints that belonged to Tony Russo on that flyer. They realize how close this homeowner came to the same tragic end as Diane. She probably came the closest, was probably the one that would have had something bad happen to her. And I think she sensed that. She felt that. She said that. It was just, I guess, by the grace of God that the baby cried and, and gave her an out. Really affected her, really freaked her out that I let this guy into my house and I could have been that woman. Rousseau is arrested for making a false report to an officer. It's a misdemeanor, but it's enough to keep him in jail until they're ready to charge him with murder. 
They asked 15 of the female homeowners who'd come in contact with the suspected killer to attend a live lineup. There was approximately five other men of the same height and body type, uh, hair, uh, eye color, as the suspect in this particular case. Repeat the following phrase. You have a beautiful house. You have a beautiful house. We put these people side by side, and we give them things to say that were uh, said to all these other people. I remembered your house from before. Kind of his ruse, whatever he used to get into the homes. I'm going to pay cash for a house. 10 out of the 15 witnesses identified Tony Russo as the man who came to their home. Now it's up to police to prove motive. We can assume it's because he likes to attack women. When I start to uh, ask him questions about whether he choked women and whether he liked choking women. We had some very interesting conversations about some cases that you were involved in. Those cases involved you choking women. And at that point, he terminated the interview. I would really, really like to see my wife. So our big dilemma here is how do we make the jump from lying to get into a home to actually murdering somebody? Investigators have a theory that's rapidly gaining ground. We believe that Tony Russo came to Diane Hollick's home um, the, the morning of her death. When he found her to be the perfect victim, young, beautiful, and home alone, he told her he'd come back later that day with his wife. It was our theory that he returned during the storm. I think he took all the tools he would need to subdue his victim. She probably gave him a bath towel from her bathroom to dry off with. At that point, we surmised that she had been taken from behind and laid on the carpet and strangled. He dragged her body into the bedroom. And then left her upstairs, deceased. And then when he was done with the deed, he would take it all with him and destroy it. And that's why we had not been able to find any piece of evidence linking him to Diane up to that point. Would the tiny hairs found on the bath towel provide police with that crucial link to investigators' excitement? The mitochondrial sequence from the hair fragments was consistent with Tony Russo's DNA. But that partial DNA profile could also have come from someone else entirely. To make their case, investigators will need to prove Russo is near the scene of the murder the day Diane was killed. First, they issue a subpoena for his phone records. Then we were able to issue a second subpoena to get the actual cell phone towers that his calls were hitting off of. And by getting the locations of those cell phone towers, we could place Tony Russo in the vicinity of Diane Holick's home at about the time she was killed. Investigators now have enough to charge Russo with Diane Holick's murder. But with the evidence against him largely circumstantial, is it enough to convict him? We decided that it would be an important piece of information if we could get Mr. Russo's computer and we could search it to see if he had ever pulled up the listing for Diane's house. But what Davis discovers about Tony Russo leaves even seasoned investigators reeling. We finally zeroed in on what the motive was. It was horrifying. Investigators finally have enough evidence to charge 37-year-old Tony Russo with strangling Diane Hollick to death. When we found Tony Russo's fingerprints on that flyer, it was a huge relief because we finally had a piece of physical evidence that connected Tony Russo to Diane's murder. Hoping to strengthen her case, Darla Davis tries to uncover all she can to convince the jury that Russo is guilty. Well, we were able to get a printout of the internet history of Mr. Russo's computer. And that's just basically a list of every internet site that that computer has gone to. They were looking for evidence Russo had been in search of homes for sale. Instead, they were horrified by the site he repeatedly visited. The website describes itself as tastefully erotic death scenes. You can choose the way that you would like to see a woman killed 
and his choice was asphyxiation. The 37-year-old married father of two had viewed a shocking 1,000 pictures of women being strangled. I've been a prosecutor for almost 20 years, and I've never seen anything close to what I was seeing on this website. But it's Russo's last download in the days before Diane's murder that really gets their attention. The last story was a man who acted like he was going to buy a home, got into a woman's home, and basically strangled her to satisfy the urge of the asphyxiation. And the bottom line was that the, uh, the murder in the story said to make it look like it was a robbery, and that way nobody would ever suspect the strangulation was actually the whole point of the murder, not the robbery. It was sickening. Obviously, the person who had been looking at these pictures and then who had recreated it in real life was a dangerously disturbed person. To pursue the death penalty, Davis must prove the murder was committed during a burglary. So they returned to Russo's trailer, hoping to find Diane's $20,000 engagement ring. It took a very long time to piece by piece go through everything in the house, every piece of clothing, look in every cabinet, look in every little tiny place that someone could hide a piece of jewelry. Despite their best efforts, they come up empty-handed. We found nothing that would help with the investigation. As they drive away, something catches Detective De Los Santos's eye. As we completed the search over at the, at the trailer, we noticed that there was some fencing that was still rolled up that had not been put out. And keeping the fencing together were these zip ties. We knew that zip ties had been used to bind Diane's hands. So that was a eureka moment. That was something that was very significant. They remove the tie and send it in for analysis. The crime scene expert at the Department of Public Safety was able to compare the size of the zip ties that we found on Mr. Russo's property to the size of the markings on Diane's wrists and found that they were a match. On February 5th, 2004, the trial of Anthony Patrick Russo gets underway in an Austin, Texas courtroom. 14 women take the stand to testify that Russo had approached them about purchasing their home. Mr. Russo was in no position financially to begin to afford the houses he was looking at. He wasn't the person that he portrayed himself. His finances were practically in ruins. Davis presents the mitochondrial DNA evidence from the hair fragments, along with the disturbing details of Russo's internet history. We subpoenaed the webmaster for this website, and he provided us unfettered access so that we could recreate for the jury the specific vignettes that Tony Russo had been looking at. Can Davis paint a convincing picture of a man not motivated by sex, but by the overwhelming urge to kill? With a sexual sadist, it's not just playing at consensual bondage. What he is after is hunting, taking a woman unawares and killing her. For him, the climax is not a sexual act that we would understand. It is the actual act of homicide. After deliberating for 11 hours, the jury reaches their decision. We, the jury, find the defendant, Patrick Anthony Russo, guilty of the offense of capital murder. And he received a life sentence. And they chose not to give him the death penalty, which I'm fine with. As long as Tony Russo is behind bars and can't hurt any other women, how can I not feel good about that? Diane's friends and family breathe a sigh of relief when they hear the verdict. I turned around to Diane's parents, and we just hugged. But we hugged so hard, it was like we almost hugged right into our bones. Tony Russo won't be eligible for parole until he is 93 years old. Had he gotten away with this murder, I, I believe with, with all my heart that Tony Russo would still be out there today trying to strangle women. So I feel I have to compliment all the women who had that creepy feeling and wrote down a license plate or had the foresight to, to keep a flyer, because ultimately that's what really broke the case for us and helped us solve this.
We would not stop until we found who had done it. And we were able to do it in a matter of days, but it took everybody working together to be able to find this man and find him before he killed again. For more information, go to ownca.oprah.com slash murder she solved.